about nothing less but the future of artificial intelligence, please give a warm welcome to Luke Dickin. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, if you could lower your expectations a little bit, that would be good. Uh, yeah, so, session today, once it's up on the screen, is called Dreams of Electric Sheep. Um, so this is aspirations for the future of game AI and where we're going, uh, and a little bit about why we're nowhere near there yet. So uh, I'll start off by, I've kind of had a decent introduction already, thank you very much. But um, So what I like to talk about sort of my background when I get started, and to be honest, this slide is getting so full that I'm kind of just going to skip over it. So. Here's a list of things I do, but before this goes away, in the bottom right corner here, the Game AI Pro book comes out in Europe this week. This is collected wisdom of Game AI professionals, so if you're interested in what I'm talking about today, then please consider checking out the book, because there's lots more good stuff in there. Um, so the short version of who I am. I write, and I lecture, and I talk about all sorts of good stuff all around the world from, uh, well, this past sort of year, it's been GDC, in San Francisco all the way down to a high school in Bulgaria. Uh, so kind of the whole spectrum. Um, I do research. Uh, I'm a PhD student occasionally. Uh, I turn up at my desk about once a month. Um, and I also do sort of academic stuff. Uh, game development is obviously something that I'm very passionate about and I try and find time for. But a lot of my time goes on community advocacy and working for the IGDA uh, in a bunch of different roles. But kind of the theme that runs through everything that I'm doing and my background is all about artificial intelligence. I've been working in AI since I was about, well, I've, been, I've got three, nearly four degrees in AI. Uh, I've been messing around with this stuff since I was about 13. Uh, so this is kind of my whole background. So when we talk about AI, when, when I sort of mention AI to people, they get this kind of look in their eye, because they're thinking of this kind of thing. Um, and they think that I'm trying to take over the world, which I am, but not in this way. Um, AI is seen as this scary thing, right? It's, it's this kind of robots taking over the world, and we've had sort of 50 years now of these, what I call robo-sploitation movies, where, you know, the evil, evil empire is going to come, and they're all made of metal, and they all have glowy eyes. Uh, and, and we're nowhere near that. I mean, doorknobs at the moment are the big thing that robots can't really get their heads around. Um, and if you can't open doors, and velociraptors can, then you know, you're, in a, you're in a pretty good position in terms of how you're going to die for robots. But when we sort of talk about where we're going to be in 15 years, and bring in the Blade Runner, Blade Runner reference, we're talking about this kind of thing. So Rachel is an android and she has human emotions, and she thinks that she's human because she's got implanted memories. This is kind of the future of AI, and this is the aspiration for where we're going to be eventually. And this is kind of where we are just now. Um, we've got something that can kind of walk around, and it can kind of talk at you a little bit, and then it'll walk into a wall or something. Um, and, and this is kind of the difference between where we want to be and where we're going to be. So I can't really see, but hands up uh, who saw me talk last year at console. Not enough of you have your hands up. That's a shame. I could have just done that talk over again. Um, OK, so last year, what we talked about was um, losing with style. The idea of the AI in the game world is not to beat the player. It's to manage the divide between challenge and frustration. You want to provide something that is very challenging to your player, whilst at the same time not making it frustrating. And that kind of adaptive kind of play is an AI problem. So uh, Brian Schwab from Blizzard calls this being a good dad. You're not sort of wanting to crush your child in like playing catch or something. You've got to find a way to let them win and let them think that they are winning on their own. And that is kind of one of the big roles of AI. We talked about procedural content generation and we talked about tailoring content to player types and actually identifying who the players were and then customizing the content so that it suited them. And um, one of the, the other things that we talked about is how you can have all the algorithms you want and you can have all these amazing things that look good on the whiteboard and they, all the math checks out 
If you don't expose it to designers in a way that they can actually work with, then nobody is ever going to care about it. Because at the end of the day, it has to be integrated with the workflow and the pipeline, and it has to be something that the developers who don't know about AI can just pick up and work with. But the big thing that we talked about last year was this idea of the mechanical dungeon master. And this was the idea that a lot of the AI techniques that we have right now could be used in, in put together in such a way that we manage the gameplay and the flow of the game in very much the same way as a dungeon master on the tabletop would work. So that's letting the player tell their own story and have their own adventure and allowing them to do things. Adapting to interactions that we couldn't necessarily conceive of at develop time, but that they want to do in the game world. They want to do something, so we figure out a way to let them do that. Um, and understanding the player and understanding what they're looking to get out of it. That is one of the big things about the tabletop experience, is that you are always playing with people, or you're generally playing with people that you know, people that you sort of getting together and having a beer and, and sort of pizza with, and then having an evening of gameplay. And when you get to know those guys, you can adapt the gameplay to suit them. So that was last year. So I've got to come up with something new for the next sort of 45 minutes. So let's talk about graphics. So yesterday, Ernest said that we can, uh, sort of the, the model previously has been that we make a game, and then we give it a sort of spit and polish, and we try and sell it off again. Um, so let's talk about Battlefield. No judgments. So this is 1942. This came out in 2002. And in the screenshot, you can see an aircraft carrier. And you can recognize it as an aircraft carrier. And you can see that you're a guy with a gun. Brilliant. That's what we want out of a shooty game. And three years later, they came out with Battlefield 2. And here's an aircraft carrier. Uh, and uh, it, it looks nicer, it looks good, it's, uh, it's a little bit more polished. Um, then they went away for six years, and they did some stuff in Vietnam and stuff like that, but nobody cares about that stuff. They came out with Battlefield 3, and here's an aircraft carrier. Uh, and it looks really good this time, it looks amazing, it's, it's phenomenal, it couldn't get any, possibly get any better until two years later, when Battlefield 4 is releasing in a couple of weeks. Uh, and here's an aircraft carrier. What has that actually added in the last sort of 11 years to gameplay? Nothing, right? This is an aircraft carrier. 11 years ago, it was an aircraft carrier. We could see what it was. We knew how to interact with it. We knew its role on the game, in terms of gameplay. In terms of, of like the design of the game, nothing's changed. We're still in a shooty game. And this is the Frostbite engine. This is something that cost millions upon millions of dollars to put together. So really, all we're doing is polishing things up, and we're shoving it out again, and we're putting it in a new box. Is that really a good use of the dollars? Is it where we should be spending things? Graphics, and I said this last year, graphics is diminishing returns. We're spending all this money, and the amount that we're getting back in terms of how it's adding to the gameplay, how it's adding to the world experience, is reducing every time, and it's costing more and more and taking longer and longer. There is nothing wrong with this. Minecraft proved that graphical fidelity is not a mod uh, an indicator of success. This works. This is, a, this is a game. You can polish up the design a little bit, and they have over the last 11 years. Brilliant. Great. But at the same time, it's basically the same game. So graphics isn't taking us anywhere new. It's not taking us where we need to go as game designers and game developers. And that's not really so surprising when you look at some of the things that are being said right now. So here are some words from the wise. Um, this is what the intelligent people are saying about AI right now. So Warren Spector thinks that AI needs a savior. So the actual quote is, I've been actively trying to shame some of my fellow developers, specifically John Carmack and Tim Sweeney. Can you imagine what games would look like if those two guys spent as much time working on non-combat AI as they do on rendering? Can you imagine what games we would have if John Carmack decided he wanted to create a believable character as opposed to a believable gun? Great. So that's put all of us out of a job just now because apparently we don't do AI. John Carmack needs to come along and save us. John Carmack knows about graphics, and we've just shown that graphics aren't really taking us where we need to go. We don't need somebody like John Carmack. We have guys like that in the AI world. What we need to do is start listening to them, and we need to start building them into the game design process. 
So that was actually a year ago, and I've been bitching about it ever since. Uh, so that's why it makes it onto all my slides. Um, and there is a, a sort of long uh, response blog post that I wrote that's floating around uh, on Gamma Sutra. Last week, Star Long said that the dream, wait, hang on. The dream is to have AI that can pass a Turing test and be fun to interact with at the same time. I still haven't experienced that. Well, that's because that's not what we're trying to do, right? Passing the Turing test is fuck all to do with games. Like, it's just not at all what we're trying to achieve. What we need to be doing is something that is this whole sort of experience management. We need to be making games fun. It doesn't matter whether we can pass a Turing test. It doesn't matter whether you think that what you're playing against is a human enemy or it's a deathmatch bot or whatever. That's not at all part of the experience. Part of the experience is kind of what is happening in the world. So let's talk about what the actual role of AI in games is. When we talk about interactions with the world and the player interacting with the world, we understand that that is physics, right? We're pushing, we're pulling, we're prodding, we're poking. We're doing all these things in the world that involve our player character interacting with that world. And that is, by and large, going to be physics. We never really talk about what happens when the world interacts back, when things happen back to us. That is AI. That is the whole thing, when a, the computer is making a decision that is affecting the world, that is artificial intelligence. That, at its core, is what it's all about. So anything that happens in that world that happens back to the player is AI. And the texture of that and how it feels and how that creates an immersive experience, that is AI. That is what it's all about. So let's continue the theme of picking on people. State of the art, if you read the press, it's Bioshock Infinite right now in AI. So the Kotaku headline was, an effing AI in Bioshock Infinite is more of a human than I am. And this even got onto NBC News, and the headline there was, Bioshock Infinite takes the artificial out of artificial intelligence. And that's bollocks. So let's talk about why. So, OK, so this is Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a companion character in Bioshock Infinite. And you can see here that she's overhearing this conversation and listening to what's going on. And then she's going to wander forwards a little bit and have a think, look back at the player, and then she's going to dash off and do this. And this is kind of the big thing that they were highlighting. This is actually from uh, an AI uh, dev commentary. And she's going to go over here and do this and, and try and interact with this stuff. Uh, and apparently, these are heavy, and she can't lift them. And she's going to go back to her idle state and have a think about it. And then she's going to dash off and do something else. What we've got here is a sequence of hotspots all around this beach. And dependent on where the player's gaze is, and dependent on what is triggering as interesting for her, she's going to run off and play a canned animation somewhere. Is this really AI? Is this really state of the art? Is this really the best we can do, is choosing which of a bunch of stations to go and play at? I don't think so. So let's look at this one now. This is from the same video. This is uh, what I'm calling attention seeking. So you can see that everybody in the scene is looking off to the left. And Elizabeth is doing the same thing. Even as she's moving around, she's got focused on the same point. Uh, and in just a second, you should see what's up there. And you can see that it's that tower. And the tower's been blown up. And it's smoking. And everybody's focused on that. And the guy in the corner has only just noticed it. So he's pointing it out. And she's going to stop. And when she stops, she's going to look at it. And uh, it's, drawing every, it's drawing every character in that scene's attention. And it's, as a consequence, drawing the player's attention. At the same time, it's not really AI, because they don't understand why they're looking over there. They just know, interesting. OK, well, my, you know, it's coded into the head look routine, right? I mean, basically, you just told them, look over there, walk that way. That's all it is. It's not AI, it's, it's animation. And it's also a little bit worse than that, because I, I cut that one off a little bit early. Uh, so if we roll back to just before that, that sequence started, what we have is uh, a scripted sequence where uh, we have to choose which necklace she's going to wear. Um, and immediately after that, here's what happens. So she turns, 
And she begins, and this guy runs over. And then he starts pointing, and everybody in the scene starts pointing to draw the player's gaze, right? That tower exploded about 10 minutes ago in game time. And these guys are only just noticing it now. That's not AI. That's not smart. That's not characters that are actually engaged with the world. That's just hacking around to find a way to point out to the player that something is going on. That's not good AI. So the big thing about Elizabeth was that she was useful to you in combat, and she can provide assistance to you as, you as you're actually playing around. So let's look at that. So she can zap these things into the world that you can take advantage of. And then guys come down and start attacking you, and she'll throw you extra ammo. And really, all she's doing is she's in cover, and when your ammo runs low, she offers you the option of throwing you ammo. That's an if statement. That's not AI. And we could make it a little bit more interesting and say, OK, well, if your ammo's low and your health's low, then choose between ammo and health, and we'll throw one of them to you. And we've got to have a delay on that. We can't constantly be throwing stuff. So, so let's say that we could only throw stuff about once a minute or something like that, whatever. You know, tweak it to make it feel right, but that's about the rate, maybe. And again, only if I'm in cover can I throw you things, and only if you're in danger can I throw you things. Well, we've just put this whole thing together with if statements, and it's not actually rocket science, right? So Ken Levine, who's creative director over at Irrational, says, in no way, shape, or form is this an escort mission. Because this was the big thing that players really didn't like about the idea of Bioshock before they got their hands on with it, was this idea that they were going to have to escort Elizabeth around and, and take care of her and protect her and stop her from dying. So let's look at that in action. So here you're running around, there's a big battle going on, uh, and you're going to jump off the, the slidey thing and punch guys, shoot them, jump down. The big question to me right now is, is where's Elizabeth? Right? She's not involved in this battle. And there's a whole big thing happening over at the other end there, and you're going to jump in and sort of fight over there. She's not there either. And in a second, you'll find out where she is, but I've forgotten how long this bit goes on for. Um, wow, I could have cut this down quite a bit. There we go. So she's up on the catwalk, right? She's right out of the action. So it's not an escort mission, because she's not actually involved. And here, you're going to see she's in the corner there. So this scene, here comes a guy, and he runs right past her. He ignores her. Because as far as the enemy AI NPCs are concerned, she doesn't exist. And that's why it's not an escort mission. You don't have to escort her because nobody's ever going to attack her. That's not AI. That is smoke and mirrors. And that is the big problem with where we are right now, is we have this smoke and mirrors approach to AI, which is fine, but it's not good AI. It's what I call designer-driven AI. So the animation hotspots on the beach were designer-placed and designer-tweaked, and they actually laid things out such that you know, they knew how that beach would work. Now, some of it was being uh, generated by input from the player. So one of the things she does on the beach is she always tries to stay in the field of view. Um, but it, it's not... It's not actually making many decisions, and it's not making interesting decisions for itself. And then you look at something like the, the, uh, the combat thing. Well, we know that that's not really AI. We've, we've talked about how we can put that together. This isn't rocket science. And it turns out that really the problem with Elizabeth and the, the thing that, where she fails most as an AI in what they're trying to do is that final scene where she stood on a balcony, and she can't avoid the combat encounter, so they ignore it. And that's immersion breaking. And that is where the AI falls down in Elizabeth, because it's clear there that what they're trying to do is create an AI that avoids combat, and they're failing. And that is creating this breaking of, of the illusion of uh, disbelief. So yesterday, Alex talked about, uh, about zombies and how prevalent they've been in games. Um, he said that, that sort of everything goes in cycles and zombies are going away. I don't think they are. Um, and the reason that I don't think they are is that zombies are an amazing way 
of justifying shit AI. Um, they, they, they really are. It's a design solution to an AI problem. So if you have two guys walking down uh, a road and you shoot one of them and he falls over, then you expect the second guy to react and you expect him to either take cover or call for backup or scan for snipers or whatever kind of expectation, but he should have some reaction. And that is the player's expectation and the role of AI is to meet that expectation. If you make those guys, if, if instead of being soldiers, they were zombies, it makes sense. The player expects that they won't react. They expect that they will see two shambling things coming towards them, one gets shot in the face, and the other one just carries on shambling, because we understand that zombies don't reason in the same way. So they are a really good way of getting out of having to do things smart by lowering expectations. And this is the kind of thing where design and, and the design of the game and the narrative and sort of psychological tricks can be used to alter our expectations and actually make it such that what's happening in the game matches our expectations and it's not bad AI. Um, so Elizabeth is part of the religion of the Bioshock world. She's a, a very big central feature of that. And as a result of that, that kind of justifies her non-combat status, right? Nobody wants to attack this sort of semi-Messiah figure. Um, it's managing expectations. It's finding a way in the narrative to justify what's wrong with the AI. So, what do we want? Good game AI. When do we want it? Yeah, eventually. Uh, I mean, it's not something that we're going to get immediately. It's not going to happen overnight. But what we need to be working towards is living worlds. And the kind of distinction that I make here is between games that want to deliver the experience and games that want to deliver an experience. So the experience games are games like uh, your Call of Duties, your Starcrafts, your Battlefields. There is a linear progression through the game. Um, and essentially what you're playing out is a quick time event. It's a, it's a glorified quick time event over story progression. There is no scope for doing something different. There is no scope for anything really other than shooting people in the face or whatever the gameplay sort of mechanic is to earn more of the story. And that's fine. I mean, it's one way of approaching game design. And experience games are a lot more interesting to me from an AI point of view because what we're trying to do here is say there are multiple paths through this world and there's multiple choices and you can take any route you want within reason and actually develop that into something that is going to be consistent with your choices. You're letting the player tell an experience, not sort of within certain restrictions, but the experience that they choose to, to have. So if you look at Mass Effect, I mean, Mass Effect's branching narrative span over three games. That's an insane number of choices. That's an insane number of endpoints that you could reach. Um, and then we can take that a little bit further, because there is also, beyond that, any experience. So Minecraft is kind of the first example of this any experience kind of game. Um, and it works because it takes out a lot of the problems that you would have if you tried to do an any experience kind of game in a more traditional setting. So the Vox... That wasn't supposed to do that. Okay. So let's carry on talking about Minecraft. Um, the voxel world is such that you can sort of deform it on your own. And that is interesting. That is finding a way to hack around the design of the world. The fact that there's no sort of dialogue means Jory's not happy. But at the same time, we can actually have a, a large sort of broad set of experiences happening in there. If you tried to constrain Minecraft by having dialogue in there, you would be limited by how much dialogue you could have, and it would either become repetitive, or you would end up in a situation where we don't have dialogue for what you're doing right now, or you can't do that because we don't have dialogue for what you're doing right now. So that's kind of how Minecraft gets around it, but we need to find better solutions to that. So Ernest talked about sort of generating natural language, so that's the kind of thing that we need to be talking about. Uh, so I'll not talk about it again today. Um, but beyond that, persistent worlds. Persistent worlds, to me, are worlds that are going to exist without the players. 
and they're going to evolve without the players. So, I mean, when we talk about persistent worlds in the traditional kind of sense, we're talking about characters that you can log in and log out, and it's the same character, and you can pick up where you left off, right? Um, what's more interesting is games like, um, like Versu from Linden Labs on the iPad. Uh, it's a brilliant interactive fiction game. And I think I mentioned it last year, but I wasn't able to name names because I was still under NDA. Um, but it's a, it's a thing where the world is simulated and you can choose to take part in the adventure or not. And this is something that, uh, that I've heard a lot talking about the, the mechanical Dungeon Master thing, where players turn up for the gaming session and the Dungeon Master tells them all about the village that needs to be saved. And they all decide to just sit in the pub for the night. Screw the village, we're having a pint. The fact that you can do that on the tabletop is interesting. The fact that you can do that in this Versu game is very interesting because it's finding ways to do it with AI such that the world carries on and somebody else will save the village and they'll get the rewards and they'll be the heroes and you'll be the town drunk. What's the problem with that? That is a really interesting gameplay experience. But to do that, we're going to need some stuff. So our characters need to be better. We need to be doing stuff that's actually AI, not this sort of hacky smoke and mirrors stuff. And that means understanding the environment. We need to understand how our, our actions are going to alter the environment, how we can shape the environment to do what we want to achieve. Um, and we need to understand what's meaningful and what's important. We need those characters to look at that statue because it has significance and symbolism. And the fact that it's on fire is important to them, not because a designer put a little landmark down that says, look here. We need to understand the player. We have, a, a, as humans, we have a, a reasonable understanding of the people around us, um, sometimes. Uh, but like we, we have a, a, an expectation of what, what's rational and how we expect people to interact with each other and with us. So we can kind of make basic plans that are maybe fairly broad strokes, but at the same time, we know that nobody's sort of going to storm out of here because I said you need to understand the player, because that's not really rational. Um, I don't know, some of the stuff I say, I mean, I could maybe see it on a couple of other slides. Uh, but you need to be, have this understanding of what the player's going to do in order to work out what's going to happen next. And if you can work out what's going to happen next, then you can start building that in as a character. And that means understanding intentions. What does it mean when the player tries to do this? What are they actually trying to achieve? So when they press, you know, if you've got a sequence of three buttons that need to be pressed to open a door, when they press the first one, what they're trying to do is open the door. There is meaning in actions, and there is meaning that needs to be understood from actions, and this is the kind of thing that we need to be building in. And this is kind of what I've been doing for the last sort of five years, is creating uh, or, or researching an architecture that would actually allow this, and I'm close to finished writing my thesis-ish, maybe. Um, but this is kind of what we need to be heading towards. But when we talk about AI, particularly when we talk about AI from a computer science background, we talk about quality of decisions. We're always solving to optimality in, in computer science. We are always looking for the best way of doing something, the shortest path, the uh, cheapest way of producing something. Solving to optimality when it comes to games is a problem because that means, generally, when we apply that logic, we talk about trying to beat the player. And we've already said that that's not the point and it's not fun. So how can we kind of work around that? Well, our AI systems can work out what the best thing to do is, and we don't want to do that. So what we need to be doing is finding out what reasonable things to do. So choose between reasonable things that are suboptimal, and how suboptimal you go determines difficulty effectively. But as long as it retains this sort of reasonable kind of band at the top-ish, of things that you could do, it remains in that rational kind of, these are the things that I would expect people to do kind of realm. So I want to talk a little bit about a game called Redshirt that I've been working on. Uh, it's on pre-order right now. Uh, you can buy it, you can have a Steam code, it'll be out, I don't know. It's not actually my game, so uh, I don't know when it's out, but it's developed by a small developer in the UK called The Tiniest Shark. 
uh, and I was contracted to provide the AI for it. So the, pre uh, the premise of the game is that you're a red shirt crew member on a space station, um, and the space station's gonna blow up. So you need to survive your away missions and climb the sort of social and career ladder to a point where people care about you and you're not gonna be left on the space station when it blows up. Uh, and the way that you do that is um, through Spacebook. And this is the only interaction that you have with the game. Uh, and you, you interact with all the NPCs and all the characters on the space station through Spacebook. Um, and you, you create status updates, you like status updates, you invite people to events, and if they like you, they may say yes. Um, and then you go to work. And the idea is basically that you kind of make friends with the next boss, and then you find your, your sort of next job, and you kind of climb the career ladder, or you get into a relationship with the captain of the space station, or something like that. So it's kind of this parody simulator of social networking. And it's, uh, it's been getting rave reviews. But the thing that's really interesting here is this kind of notion of rationality and reasonableness. Because when you're dealing with something like this, there is an expectation of how people are going to engage with you. And we needed NPCs to have a certain personality. And when they acted, they had to act in the context of that personality. So Astra at the top there has certain character traits. And if she were to post on Facebook something that doesn't meet with those character traits, so if we say that Astra is the happy person and she posts something really negative, well, if we're in the real world, right, and, and one of your friends who's, who's obnoxiously happy said something really terrible, you would know something bad was going on in their life and you would ask them what's wrong. If that happens in Redshirt, we get an email that says, your AI shit. Um, and that is kind of this thing where we have a lot less scope for any sort of failure. We need to meet these expectations. Um, and that means we have to know what the expectations are and manage our decision making such that we can do that. So the way that we did that was to, um, down in the bottom right here, we've got these uh, different uh, metrics for, for the status of the character, of the player character. Um, and what we did was we, we sort of used that as the model for how the NPCs worked, uh, and we clamped each one within certain uh, limits. But that gave us like this, this sort of fixed idea of a personality, and they could become happier or they could become sadder, but within a certain range. Um, and then we fed that into a logic system, and uh, it was all good. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of the key point, though, is... is meet the player's expectations, set them up, and then meet it. So uh, I said I would talk a little bit about uh, hardware and stuff, and I don't like doing it, but I will, uh, because it's, it's kind of an important time for all of us. Um, Next-gen opportunities. So a couple of months from now, we're going to have all shiny new hardware, which um, will have been conned into buying by the powers that be, which, fair enough. Um, and if you were, were watching sort of the E3 streams when that was all coming out and all the press conferences and all the hype and the flash and the blah, then you might have heard AI get brought up on a regular basis about how amazing it was going to be uh, in next gen because we got all this new hardware and it was going to be fantastic. More horse horsepower equals better AI, surely. I mean, that's, that's the problem, right? We don't have enough bandwidth for, for doing everything that we need to do. Um, well, no, not really. So Ernest talked a little bit yesterday about... Um, uh, no, that's on the next slide. Um, yeah, I brought them late, I'm sorry. Uh, so, yeah, so on this slide, what we're going to talk about is... Um, so yesterday, in fact, it might have been in Ernest's talk, somebody mentioned the Uncanny Valley. And so is everybody familiar with the Uncanny Valley? Hands up. OK, right, so I can carry on. Brilliant. In AI, we don't have an Uncanny Valley. Uh, I like to think of it as an uncanny minefield, because there isn't just, it's not just one-dimensional for us. Like, there are so many ways that we can fuck up and look stupid that like, it's mind-boggling. So in academia right now, um, in sort of the, the work that I spun out of for my PhD, state-of-the-art means that every two years they get together and they have themselves a little competition. Um, and they solve problems, and they, it's who can solve it the best and who can solve it the quickest, basically. Um, 
And when they solve these problems, they get seven gigabytes of RAM. And they get half an hour per problem. So we're going to have really crap games if that's what we're trying to do. Because uh, if every frame we need to make decisions and we're going to take half an hour a frame, that's going to be crap. The problem isn't that we need more horsepower. I mean, long term it is. But even still, these guys in academia are not solving problems particularly well. And they're not necessarily making problems or, or solutions that are human-like. The problem isn't necessarily finding a solution. The problem is finding a solution that looks right and is this kind of rational, understanding the player, understanding the world. A shiny plastic box from Microsoft is not actually going to solve that problem because at the end of the day, we don't have an understanding of what it means to be human. We don't have an understanding of how the brain works. And until we have that, we can't model it and we can't replicate it. And yes, we can see that obviously it's going to be a horsepower problem ultimately. The human brain has this phenomenal capacity for computational power that we just don't have. But the short term, that's not the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the understandings and the animations and making it look right, making it feel right. So yesterday, this is the one where I talk about Ernest. Um, it, Ernest said something about dedicated AI hardware and the comparison to graphics cards. And that's, it's OK, but it's never going to work, right? So <coughs> what if the player, so 15 years ago, when graphics cards were coming in, um, what if you didn't have a good graphics card? Well, your game didn't look great. I mean, it, it, you could still play it probably, and it would look pretty naff, and you would go around your friend's house and say, oh, I wish you could buy one of them. Um, but you got basically the same gameplay experience. You got you know, something that you could pick up, play, have a go with, and wish that you had a better job. Um, OK, let's, let's move into AI. What happens if you don't have a very good AI card? Well the enemy's not going to be as smart, or there's not going to be as many enemies, or the pathfinding's not going to work quite as well. So scaling AI based on hardware is going to fundamentally alter gameplay. It's going to fundamentally change the experience that the player is having. That's not a good thing. That's not something that we should be aiming for. AI doesn't scale in the same way that people can have the same experience whether they have spent not much money or all the money on their hardware. <laughs> and kind of this reinforces to me how irrelevant graphics is. Because the fact that we can say that people have effectively the same experience on crap graphics versus good graphics kind of means that graphics is nothing to do with games. It's a viewport into a world, but it's not actually sort of doing anything to change that experience. If you think about it, Compare it to sort of um, a book, say. You know, the analog for a book is the cover art and the font. Nobody cares about that. You know, that's not part of what makes you an author. And graphics shouldn't have the emphasis that they have. And I know I'm acting really sort of bitter about it. It's because they take all our cycles. Um, so yeah, so that's really kind of what, what I wanted to say today. Um, so what I want you to take away is some final thoughts on, like, don't believe the hype, basically. Um, Microsoft will tell you that AI is about to be solved, and it's not. Microsoft will tell you, uh, Sony will tell you, I'll pick on somebody else. Uh, they'll all tell you that, you know, oh, this new hardware is going to be amazing for AI. It's not. It's not going to be anything. And, and the guys who tell you that they've got amazing AI in their games generally don't. What we're doing right now is re relying far too heavily on designers. And I, I like designers. Uh, they're OK. But they, they're sort of giving this illusion of AI. And they're kind of smoke and mirrors and gaffer taping the whole thing because we're not sort of where we need to be as a medium in terms of AI. So the future of AI is that the smoke and mirrors that we use is going to diminish. And 
Partly that's because AI has, has huge potential. We've scratched just the surface of what AI can do. I mean, the amount of money and, and stuff that gets spent all over the place, and very little of it comes to AI research. But the, we have like so many lowest hanging fruit left. And partly hardware is going to be a bottleneck. I mean, long term, it's going to be the case that we need better hardware. But right now, I, I don't see it. But really, what I want more than anything for you to take away from this session is that game AI is nothing to do with Turing tests. It's nothing to do with anything except uh, the experience. Game AI, like everything in game development, has to affect the player's experience and their engagement with the game. If they're not enjoying the game because of the game AI, the game AI needs to go. And if they could be enjoying it more because of stuff that we know that we're not getting to shove into the game, that's a problem in the process as well. So I will move on to questions, but I also have my calls to action right on the slide. Um, I learned stuff yesterday. Uh, so yeah, you can pick up Red Shirt. Uh, and like I said, the, the book comes out uh, next week. It's put together by a whole bunch of us who uh, work in the field. Uh, and there's articles on all sorts of AAA games. So if you found any of this interesting, uh, you'll more than likely get something out of that. Uh, and as always, you can get hold of me through various electronic ways. So thank you very much. Oh, okay, because I'm the one with the microphone. Ah, right, yeah, so, so Linda's having technical difficulties with her microphone. There we go. Uh, so I was talk thinking about a game called Fair, uh, which I think released in 2003, which actually had pretty damn good AI for its time. Which, in which they actually did try to do things to you and actually made their own decisions and interacted with you in their, on their own terms. And I was wondering, uh, later when Modern Warfare released, which was a, good, a great game by all means, but I couldn't help but notice that it seems like AI actually went backwards since then. Is that just me or am I...? Uh, no. Um, right, okay, so fear... Uh, fear is something that I make a lot of my time beating up on. Um, and so Fears AI is, is a, a system called uh, Goal-Oriented Action Planning. Uh, and kind of what I've been doing for, for my research is building on top of that, or kind of fixing the problems that were never acknowledged. Uh, sorry, Jeff. Um, but so, so Goal-Oriented Action Planning, when it came out in research, was um, called Three States and a Plan. I can actually see you if I come over here. Um, so three states in a plan was uh, basically planning around a state machine. And that's kind of how it worked. Um, and it is a, a good-ish technique. And it was picked up in Just Cause 2 and Deus Ex, the new Deus Ex. Um, it's kind of a little bit tricky to implement. Monolith's code base is apparently really janky. Um, and uh, a lot of people, like, part of it is the design process. I mean, if, if you do design doc and you don't sort of talk about AI, um, then that would be normal, but it would also be wrong. Um, you need to talk about the AI and the world and how it's going to work, because, like, st this is exactly the problem, right? Modern warfare, they're just guys who are going to run onto the screen, get shot in the face, and fall over. Um, when, uh, so there was a talk from Bad Company 2, their average uh, lifespan of an NPC is five seconds. And like, how smart do you need to be for five seconds? You know, you, you really don't need to be amazingly intelligent to run on the screen, get shot in the face, fall over. Um, that is kind of where a lot of shooters are coming from. Fear was, um, I mean, Jeff's kind of an academic, uh, and he always has been, I think. Uh, though I, he probably wouldn't like me describing him like that. Um, but he, he wanted to do something. He wanted to push the envelope. He wanted to, to do something that was beyond what was happening at the time and somehow convinced Monolith to let him. 
And that is a conversation I would like to have with him to find out how he did that. Um, you're not wrong. Fear AI is pretty good still, even today. Uh, it's been polished up, and the techniques have been polished up since then. Um, but it's not in use across the board. And uh, a lot of that is people not wanting to add in AI. So, yeah, good point. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, have you uh, any other examples of good AI in games? Oh, that's putting me on the spot. There's not many. Um, so, I mean, it depends on what you mean by, by AI. I mean, I got told uh, a couple of months ago that the games that I make have no AI in them, which boggled my mind until I worked out that what they meant was there's no soldiers running at you. Um, so that was, that, I mean, there are games out there doing amazing things with procedural content. Uh, that's AI. There are things, uh, games out there doing like um, narrative and sort of design-y sort of things around AI, and, and that's incredible. Uh, one of the things that I always talk about is a game called Galactic Arms Race, which is on Desura just now, and I think you get a Steam code if you buy it there. Um, and the way that that works is that they have not designed any weapons. What they've designed is a framework for evolving weapons. And dependent on what the players are, are using in the game world, then they will change what the weapons are that you can pick up. And the whole thing is like particles, and uh, it's actually being driven by a neural network. And uh, for those of you who are really hardcore, it's called the CG Neat uh, algorithm. Um, well worth a look at the papers behind that. Because the, when I say that they're evolving different weapons, like you're a little spaceship and it's top down, um, and you can have three of these weapons on your ship, and like one of them might be a little wavy thing that goes out in front of you, and another one like that you pick up later will build a wall at the side of you, and another one will build swirly things around you to act as a shield. Um, and all of that is completely AI-driven. So that's, I mean, that's fascinating. That's amazing stuff, right? That's completely taking weapon design and weapon balancing out of the equation. Um, City Conquest is a game on iOS uh, that has not amazing like, AI in the game, but the actual balance of the game and, and the design of the game was all done by AI. So uh, they just sort of sat and they let the thing play against itself until it reached a point where their metrics were saying, OK, this is pretty balanced. This is where we want it to be. And at that point, it became like something that they could, they could ship. And there's a sequence of articles on that on Gamma Sutra. And I think it's about 10 posts long or something. It's really in-depth stuff. Uh, but definitely check that out. Uh, who's doing good stuff with characters these days? Not many people. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I say that Bioshock is kind of state-of-the-art, it's also fairly state-of-the-art in terms of, like, what we can actually get in there as well. Um, Crisis 2 does some... I mean, basically, if you want to know about good AI in games, buy the book, because that's where we've written about it all. Uh, Crisis 2's in the book uh, with tactical cover systems and real-time determinations of where you can go uh, to take cover and where the enemies are going to come from so that you get sort of emergent battlefield behavior. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so there's some ideas to get you started, but buy the book. Thank I you. Don't, I'm, by the way, I'm not on commission. I'm not getting a cut of the book sales or anything, so I'm actually saying that because I think it's good. Anybody else? Uh, so I was wondering, have you seen the game EverQuest Next? Yes. Uh, what's your opinion on the promises they're making for the Game master AI and the world and so on? Are we still streaming this? Uh, I think so. Right, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll... No. I'll, <laughs> uh, no, so I, I know some of the guys who are working on that, um, and, and they, they are good friends, but they can't really tell me too much about what they're doing, um, which is a shame because it is actually truly fascinating. I mean, 
the kind of thing that we're talking about there is the kind of living worlds that we're heading towards with um, kind of some constraints on it to make it actually work in an MMO kind of setting, which is necessary. But at the same time, like what they're doing is really pushing the envelope, and, and Sony's letting them do things that I'm surprised about. Um, you know, so for those of you who, who've not seen it, EverQuest Next is going to be uh, your next-gen MMO. It's going to be um, put together in such a way that you can like Minecraft your way around the environment and dig down and discover new dungeons and actually find things in this world and change the world in such a way that like, if you dig the path between A and B and you come back onto the server later, that path is still going to be there. You're, as a player, affecting the world and that, that change is, is actually persistent, as opposed to the state of the art in MMOs right now, which is you commit genocide against orcs and tomorrow you commit genocide against orcs. Um, you know, we need to be moving towards this thing where, where players' actions actually have consequence. Um, I spent five years in EVE, uh, and that was a, another really dark time in my life. Um, but at the same time, like, EVE does this really well, and it does it by completely removing design decisions from the dev team. That game is pretty much entirely player-driven, and that creates this world where there is intrigue and there can be complete changes to the universe and shifts in the political status based on player actions. So your actions have consequences, as opposed to a game where you're queuing up to tell the king that you've killed the dragon and the world is saved, and you, know, you get to see him waving his arms about 14 times before you can turn your quest in. That's not really a great MMO experience. It's not what we should be looking for. People in the game world cannot always be the chosen one. Right? You can't have a server where you have 15,000 chosen ones, because then if everybody's special, nobody's special. Uh, so what was the question? EverQuest Next. Yes, EverQuest Next is going to be, uh, if it delivers on the promise of where, what they're saying, which they're saying ambitious things, but knowing the team behind it, I think they can deliver, maybe. I'm optimistic, and I will probably be pre-ordering it, so I'm prepared to put my money where my mouth is. Anybody? Um, where would you position Dwarf Fortress? Because that's a game without any graphics. It's pure ASCII, and they try to make this any experience. Kind Sorry, which game? Dwarf, Dwarf oh, Fortress. Oh, right, yeah. I would put that... Um, well, so, I mean... Dwarf Fortress, more than anything, highlights my point about graphics, right? Um, it's, it's ASCII art, and it manages to have this cult following. Um, it is a very interesting game. I have tried to play it and lost interest within about 10 minutes, um, but partly that's my attention span issues. Um, it's, it's good. I mean, for me, so the, the game that I've been playing that's in this kind of vein is... Um, Dwarfs and Towns, which are kind of the same kind of idea, but you can download them on Steam, and they actually have tutorials. Um, and it turns out that I need tutorials, so who knew? Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, it's a very interesting game. It's definitely in the AI thing. It's very much in the sort of artificial life kind of side. Um, and that's, that's, my, that's where I came from. So when I was 13, I picked up a game called Creatures. Uh, and I don't know if anybody has seen Creatures, but it's like this little like Tamagotchi on steroids thing, where you could actually train little furry animals and teach them things and get them to breed together to, to create like a new one that knew some of the things that the parents knew but also had white fur or brown fur or stripy or whatever you wanted. Um, it was fascinating and it was really good AI. It had spun out of Cambridge, I think. Um, and, and 13 years old, it was the most amazing thing in the world. But... Artificial life is very, very interesting. I mean, it ties in with this whole thing. Dwarf Fortress is a really good example. So if, if you've not looked at it and you're interested in this kind of thing, do check it out. But you need to read the wiki before you go anywhere near it. Um, and then you probably need to just go away and cry. Uh, hi, 
thanks for in, in, an interesting talk. Um, yesterday we learned that people are dicks, right? And, yes. uh, and uh, that was interesting too. Uh, and I'm thinking these product people, these marketing people, um, they're kind of dicks. They want to uh, talk about AI all the time, Microsoft, Sony, because that sells their product. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, like the Bioshock example, for instance, uh, isn't really the problem that it's not AI, it's a game mechanic. And if it's a good game mechanic or not, we can discuss that, but that's kind of beside the point. So I'm wondering, is anyone with authority uh, trying to uh, make a definition of game AI? Because I feel from your talk that that's kind of lacking. We have it in academia, in engineering, because we want to be efficient, reach the goal, uh, but uh, that's, like you say, so precisely not what we want to do in games. So is anyone kind of sitting down and making an authoritative decision on what is AI in games and so this, that these dicks can't talk about it anymore. Kind right, of. okay, so um, yes, kind of, uh, and I get yelled at for doing it. Um, so, I mean, the, the problem is that when you talk about games, you're talking about very different worlds between two different games, and the goal of what you're trying to achieve in that world may be very different. So a few years ago, there was a, an initiative started up that was the uh, AI Interface Standards Committee. And this thing was going to f sort of build the canonical, this is how we talk about game AI, this is how we write game AI, here are standard libraries for game AI. And it doesn't work, because everybody's engine is different and everybody wants a different thing. Everybody wants their world to feel slightly different. Um, so my thing is that what we're trying to optimize in games, because I think it's very important, particularly for engaging with research, that we stay with optimality as kind of the, the language that we use. Because at the end of the day, if you say we want it to be a good game, then the academics look at you and sort of shrug um, regularly, it turns out. Um, but what, if you say what we're trying to do is we're trying to optimize fun, that becomes a very different question, and it becomes a question that they can actually maybe solve, kind of. Um, because then everybody on the game side yells at me because they say, well, how do you define fun? And I say, well, uh, because defining fun is, is still a hard problem. Nobody knows what fun is other than we know it when we see it. Um, but at the same time, that is kind of the language. So that's the language I'm using for it is optimizing fun is the role of game AI. And if that means flanking behaviors, if that means very sort of intricate soldier patterns, then that is creating a fun, engaging experience because it's immersing you in the battlefield. If it means a, a dog that actually acts like a dog and runs up to you and, and understands dog things, then that's fun because it's creating the engaging experience. It's the best we've got right now, I think. Um, and and like the, the researchers don't like it and the game developers don't like it, but I think they don't like it at about an equal level, so I think it's the best we're going to get. Hi. Um, could you comment on um, the, the game master of uh, Left 4 Dead 2? There's an electronic game master there. Yeah. Um, so, so Left 4 Dead as a series has been really good for this stuff. Um, uh, it has this thing called an AI director. And what that does is, it, is it's trying to, to manage so the flow of the game a little bit. Um, and it does it in a really interesting way. Uh, they went into the research and found something that everybody had overlooked in like 1990. Because nobody cared about it because it came out of Idaho. Uh, and nothing good ever comes out of Idaho, I reckon. Uh, but, so... This paper came out about driving and managing the simulation. Uh, it, it was a driving simulator, and they wanted to set up a situation where like, you, you could um, get cut off in traffic and, and see how the driver reacted to that. But you can't do that with a scripted sequence, right? Because how you've driven for the first sort of even 30 seconds means that you're going to be at a different point, and that the traffic around you is going to be different. So trying to sort of set up a situation where you get cut off is going to look weird. So they came up with this thing called the, the HCSM, uh, and, and everybody ignored it. And then Valve suddenly picked it up and ran with it with, with the Left 4 Dead stuff. And the way that it works is that they're trying to replicate a... Um, can you tell that I've got slides on this on my laptop that I'm sort of going towards? Um, 
they're trying to replicate a cinematic experience, and they're trying to replicate pacing from a horror movie, where you have sort of a build-up of, um, of, of tension and, and suspense that reaches a peak, and at that peak, you just get attacked by, by zombies from everywhere. And then you sort of decay, and, and there's a period of relaxation, uh, and then the whole thing starts over again. And they're trying to sort of replicate that, that cinematic pacing. And the way that they do it is by... So in Left 4 Dead 1, the, the main way that they did it was they altered where uh, pickups were in the, in the game, and uh, they would uh, alter the flow and the spawn rate of zombies and where they were and, and where they came from. Um, it, it's, very, it's very interesting. Left 4 Dead 1 didn't go far enough because there is so much in that world that you can control that will affect pacing, that will affect tension. Um, but having said that, I mean, it works, and Left 4 Dead 2 does it even better. Um, the uh, the top-down alien shooty thing that Valve put out later. I don't know. It, it, these AI directors are starting to pop up all over the place now. But like the things that we need to do is actually unify them. But the thing that they're not doing is narrative. They are controlling. Um, so so going back to my talk last year, we talked about um, the sort of overarching campaign level dungeon mastering. And then you sort of design out your, your uh, encounter space and you manage minions within the encounter space to provide an engaging tabletop experience for your players. The Left 4 Dead guys are kind of still, even though they're doing it in a very dungeon mastery kind of way, they're still very focused on minions and encounters and managing that part of the equation. There is a, a whole other side to it that's narrative, that's sort of content, that's all these other things. So yes, it's, it's an amazing step. It, it was a huge step forward. Um, at the same time, it doesn't go as far as it needs to go. So, I mean, I think that's an answer to the question. I, can I ask a question? Do I have time? If it's short. I think it's going to be too long. <laughs> okay. You're well, on conference and you can't ask uh, a question. Well, okay, I'm going to ask it anyway. Because it might be kind of the wrong crowd to ask it in. But um, one of my favorite... Uh, I guess gaming stories, if I can call it that, was a guy who uh, created this blog uh, about his, um, his player experience in The Sims. And he, he had this great thing that he, he made this dysfunctional, drunken, terrible father. Have you heard of Kemp? No. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, he, he's just, you know, worthless, doesn't have a job, will never have a job. He made everything so that he was just a worthless dad. And then he had this daughter who uh, you just felt really, really sorry for because she, 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 everything with her was that she would strive to become better but never really would. Uh, she would always be really close but never really would. And, and she was you know, completely uh, neglect, neglected by her father. And uh, so I was reading this blog and he was talking about all the terrible things. It was such a sad story, you know? And then, but then one day I started, I read the, the, the journal and, or the blog post and I actually started crying because uh, uh, the father uh, suddenly showed uh, paternal instincts and uh, helped uh, the daughter with uh, her homework um, on a bench because of course they were homeless. But uh, it was just, and, and I just, ever, it's, it's one of my favorite stories where sort of artificial intelligence comes in and says, well, listen, everything isn't completely hopeless in a way. You can't make everything absolutely dysfunctional in a way. But I don't know if that's, if I'm, if I'm reading that right. Or, and I'm also wondering, is this like the, the narrative of AI? Is that a focus point somewhere? Well, so, I mean, a lot of what you're talking about there is nothing to do with AI. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, in a very interesting way. Um, so what, what actually happened in that game was the AI made a bunch of decisions. And suddenly, there's this whole narrative being constructed around that. You know, it's not that the characters have been writing a blog. It's that some bloke has been watching this thing where, like, dots on a screen are wandering around doing things and constructed this whole anthropomorphic narrative about why they're doing it. Now, frankly, it, for, from my point of view, if that dude starts helping his daughter with the homework on a bench, that's bad game AI, because he's acting completely out of character. Um, so, you know, that is, that is kind of the thing where um, 
the, the perceptions and the expectations are sort of very different on the, on the two sides of things. But what's interesting is, is this idea of sort of the effectiveness of like the emotional connection. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's just numbers. Like all of computer science and all of AI in particular is just numbers. And yet we've got a whole blog written about a bunch of numbers. That's kind of odd in a good way. Um, but yeah, I mean, fr from my point of view, like the, the thing that affected you most is the thing that I would go, that's a bug. Um, and, and maybe that's kind of saying that, that and, and, and again, we don't understand this stuff. So maybe having that emotional connection and having something like out of character in a game like The Sims is actually something that would optimize fun. So yeah, I don't, I don't really know that I've got an answer for you uh, other than yes. <laughs> yeah, that's all we had time for right now. Thank you, Luke. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you.